Okay, I think that's our cue, Ed. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone this evening for attending our uh, first webinar from the ASQ Saskatchewan, AS, sorry, from the uh, Air Cadet League of Saskatchewan Provincial Committee. And it's our privilege to have with us today uh, Ed Wernick, who is the CEO of the Perland Project. And Ed's going to tell you uh, a lot more about it than I could. But I'll give you a little background. Uh, Ed's a commercial pilot and glider pilot, a, a and p mechanic. He was a bush pilot in Africa and the Philippines. Director of an international development project in Sudan, Africa. Thermodynamics research engineer. Uh, Michelin Morley Laboratory, China Lake, California and uh, a Russian linguist, which is probably a whole nother story, and uh, also was a member of the U.S. Air Force. And uh, the Perland II, as you would have saw in the uh, marketing, a pressurized two-place space capsule. So I'm going to let Ed take us through that. Uh, the session is being recorded. After Ed's uh, done his presentation, there should be ample time for questions at the end. And I just ask everyone if they could uh, please to uh, uh, put your mute on uh, or mic your mute, <laughs> mute your mic, and uh, and your video could be off as well while he does his presentation. Thanks, Ed. Here, take it away. Thanks, Gary. Uh... That's a that's a very kind inter introduction. And uh, if anybody has a question, uh, I don't mind if you interrupt me and ask the question right then. Sometimes in a presentation like this, there may be a slide up on the screen and you have a question about that or what I just said. So uh, go ahead and unmute if you want anytime and say, uh, I've got a question. So I've got a question to start off. How many of you have uh, taken a glider flight already? Have any of you taken a glider flight? Are you familiar with gliders? People can put the thumbs up if they like uh, in their reactions. I know quite a few people should have had a, a glider flight by now. Well, the reason I ask is the story of the Perlin is really a story of a, of a young man about your age who uh, uh, was interested in, in flying. His name was Anar Enevoldson. He was uh, born in oh. Seattle. And when he was a kid, he, uh, he, he was fascinated by flying. He was fascinated by aviation. And that's where the Perlin story really started, was Anar's, Anar's beginning as, a, as, as just a young person who thought he wanted to get more involved in aviation. He uh, became a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot first, and then he, he joined NASA. And uh, he got to fly a lot of interesting uh, airplanes in NASA, including the X-24, which was a a lifting body. And uh, my first indirect connection with ANAR was when I was at China Lake, California. I was, I was there doing some engineering work. And one of the engineers in my office was a woman named Bertha. And Bertha was a friend of ANAR's. And uh, she told me about the lifting body project. That's an airplane behind him, has no wings, and they were testing the technique that the space shuttle used. The space shuttle has stubbing, stubby wings, but it's mostly a lifting body. So this was, uh, this was an airplane with no motor. They would tow it up, and then they would release it, and it was a glider. It had a very, very steep descent angle, but it had enough control that you could, you could land it. Well, Bertha was, uh, was also a glider pilot. She gave me my first glider ride. 
And uh, I was fascinated with her tales of, of going cross country in a glider. She would say that on Saturdays or Sundays when we weren't at work, she would go fly gliders. And there are times that she would fly hundreds of miles along the backside of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. And so I became at that time fascinated with gliders. But before I became a glider pilot, I, I went off and, and became a power pilot first and, and did, did bush flying. So Adar uh, also flew gliders for NASA. If you'll notice the tail on this airplane, uh, the horizontal stabilizer is tilted at an extreme angle. This was called a deep stall research airplane. Uh, so Anar would take a tow and he would fly this particular glider up high. And then he would put it into a deep, deep, deep stable stall. And NASA was studying that. So Anar was both a glider pilot and he was a jet pilot. And it was this unique combination that allowed Anar to get this wild idea that he could fly a motorless airplane, he could fly a glider to the edge of space. Now, what gave him the idea was he was doing some test flying in Europe with the DLR, the German Space Agency. And he was walking down the hall at the DLR and he saw this picture. And uh, he noticed the altitudes here. And he thought, well, look at that. Up about 23 kilometers, there's something going up and down. It looks like some kind of wave action. And he went into the scientist's office. And he said, what is that, what is that picture that you posted? And the scientist said, well, that's a LIDAR picture. And it is of stratospheric clouds over Sweden. And Einar said, well, why are they shaped like that? And the scientist told him, well, these stratospheric clouds uh, are called Perlin clouds. And they're made by waves high in the stratosphere. Well, Einar, as a glider pilot, had flown thermals. He had flown ridge lift. And he flew waves. And so he knew about using the up part of these waves, of, of waves in general, as, as a way to keep his glider airborne. So he did some calculations. And he estimated the lifting power of waves that were at 23 kilometers altitude. And he came to the conclusion. He said, you know, with, with the right glider, you could soar those waves. And that was back in the 80s. And it became a lifelong quest and a lifelong dream of Anar's that someday he would go join these Perlin clouds. Now, the Perlin clouds are, are luminescent. Uh, and the reason they're called Perlin, which is, which is Danish for pearl or mother of pearl, is that high on the stratosphere, they glow with, with uh, pinks and yellows and orange colors. And they look a little bit like, like mother of pearl. So Adar named his quest the Perlin Project. He wanted to go soar these particular types of clouds that exist high, high, high in the stratosphere. Now, it's interesting. We called the stratosphere stratus because at one point we thought, well, everything up there is flat. There is no convective action that, that puts bumps. When I learned to be a pilot, they said, well, if you can ever make it to the stratosphere, and that was really high, uh, they said, if you can ever make it to the stratosphere, you'll be above all the weather, you'll be above all the bumps. And once you get up there, one of the advantages is it's perfectly smooth. Well, that's true unless the polar vortex amplifies mountain waves, and that's what drove these waves up to very, very high levels. So the polar vortex is a, as you know, is a, 
is a jet stream that circles the polar regions during the winter, and it has high velocity winds, hurricane strength winds, and when they encounter mountain waves, it amplifies the mountain waves to the top of the stratosphere. So the, the, the polar vortex, let me come back here. Here it is in the Northern hemisphere. It comes to life uh, just about now. It'll start uh, spinning up over the, the North Pole and it will, it will rotate around the North Pole until sometime in the spring. And when it was going over Sweden, it was amplifying mountain waves and driving them up to the top of the atmosphere. So Anar said, I think we should go fly them. Now it turns out that the, the waves uh, that are in the stratosphere happen further north in the Northern hemisphere than they appear south in the Southern hemisphere. They, in the north, they happen above the Arctic Circle so that in the winter, the days are, are very short or there's no day at all. Uh, and so flying operations, you only have a few hours of daylight and it is extremely cold. You're operating in the ice and snow. Well, the same effect exists in the Southern hemisphere, but it exists at about uh, 50 degrees uh, latitude. Uh, and so it's a little bit warmer. It's about like uh, Vancouver, British Columbia in the winter. And you get days that are not bad. You get some days that are ice and snow. Uh, the days can, can be long enough that you can have operations. So Anar first went to New Zealand and uh, he tried there for about four years and they, they never got very high and they would hit a barrier at the interface between the troposphere where you and I live down low and the stratosphere. There's an area between the two that's dead and uh, they couldn't make it through. So they switched operation to South America. They went to uh, Argentina, they went to Patagonia and uh, uh, Part of the joy of working in Patagonia is uh, scenery, there's glaciers, there's interesting wildlife. This is a relative of a llama, it's called a Wanako. And in the area where we fly, they've got thousands and thousands of them crossing the road and jumping over the fences and they're, they're an interesting critter. So the, the challenge was, this is a wave map the red is uh, not danger. The red is what we like. The red is the uh, the red is the air that's going up, and the blue is air coming down. So if you if you were to plot it, this black line is a wave pattern, and it exists very high. You'll notice that these are kilometers. And it says, you know, they go up, uh, they go up 24, 25, 26, 27 kilometers. And these are the waves that Anar saw on the LIDAR. And he said, we can soar them if we can get there. Well, the challenge is it took him seven years to be able to get through this weak zone. Here's waves down here that were generated by the Andes Mountains when the winds blow over the mountain. And then there's an area here at the tropopause between the stratosphere and the troposphere where they, they die out and they're just not strong enough to soar through. So Hanar would get up here and bounce around at fairly high altitude, 30,000 feet or so, but he just couldn't get through. They had a, uh, a regular glider. It was a DG505M, and the M stands for motor glider, and they took the engine out and they put a liquid oxygen system in so they could wear spacesuits. And they had a, uh, a regular 
Hope Lane. And these are the Andes straight ahead. So they would take off on this runway in a town called El Calafate. And at El Calafate, they would roll down the runway takeoff. And it's, uh, it's about uh, 50 miles to the mountains. But they would tow out. And then at about the ridge height, they would drop the tow and they would soar. And it turned out that they broke through the dead spot at the tropopause, and uh, they wound up on on August 29th in 2006. Einart and and Steve Fawcett were the two pilots, and wearing their borrowed spacesuits from NASA, they were able to soar to a new glider record of 50,722 feet. Now, at that point, they, they quit the flight. Uh, they were still climbing, but the pressure suits they had, the higher they went, the more the suit expanded. And at uh, over 50,000 feet, the suits were blown up and they were like the Michelin man. And they could barely operate the controls. In fact, Anar, Anar had a light computer that was that was uh, at the wrong angle. It was it was reflecting the sun. And he said I couldn't get my arm up and tilt the thing so I could uh, see it better. I, I was just the suit was too inflated. Plus they were just as cold as cold could be. The temperature was about minus 70 degrees centigrade at that altitude. And they decided, well, it's a world record, another few hundred feet or even another few thousand feet won't change the fact it's a world record. So they pulled the spoilers and they descended. But what they did that was important was they proved in our thesis that you could soar those stratospheric waves. So in 2006, for the first time, somebody soared stratospheric waves in a glider. So they then determined that they would they would build the right glider. Remember, Anar, when he saw those waves, he said, in the right glider, you could soar them to uh, 25, 26, 27,000 27, uh, meters. And uh, so they designed this glider. It was going to be all carbon fiber. It was going to be pressurized. And in order to save weight, they were going to use a rebreather system so they didn't have to throw any oxygen away. And it would be optimized so it would fly the very, very best it ever would at 60,000 feet. So they thought, well, well, the design will make it possible to climb. At 60, we'll be doing the best we can. And then the higher we go, the design is a little less efficient, but we will, we will set it up so we'll, we'll be able to make it all the way to the design limit of the airplane. So it has an 84 foot wingspan and it has a 2000 pound takeoff weight, two pilots and life support, batteries, oxygen, air for about a five hour mission. So this is, this is what it looks like. Uh, round windows uh, because any corners are stress risers. And so round windows allow the pressure difference. There's about eight pounds per square inch pressure difference between the inside and the outside of the gliders. And so if you have a, if you have a, uh, say a hundred square inch window, that means you've got 800 pounds of force on that 10 inch by 10 inch window. So uh, some of these are, are, are twice as big as that. And so you had almost a ton of pressure on, on the bigger windows. The two windows on the top are actually hatches. That's how they get in and out. And the hatches fit in from the bottom. So as the glider is pressurized, it, it seals the hatches even more. One of the problems with this glider is uh, 
they don't have a window right in front, so the pilot can't see straight ahead. They either look out a little bit to the right or a little bit to the left. And uh, uh, if we ever build another one, we'll probably put one window right in the middle and a couple of smaller ones on the side. Mm -hmm. So that was the glider that ANAR envisioned. It was designed and built in Bend, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, it has turned out to be a great glider. Now, it has two atmospheres for life support. The cabin is pressurized with regular air, only 21% oxygen. And it, it provides the pressurization. So you can see here the pilot is not wearing a pressure suit, uh, but the pilot is breathing pure oxygen. And notice there's two hoses going into the, into the oxygen mask. One is oxygen going in, and the other is the oxygen is carried away, not vented into the cabin. The reason it's not vented into the cabin, there's a, there's a couple of reasons. The first one is if you vent it into a sealed space, like a sealed capsule, you build the oxygen content up in the, in the capsule, and you may build it up to the point where it's a fire hazard. Anything of about 30%, uh, it means that many of the things that you would normally think are not flammable begin to burn, like insulation on wires. There was uh, Apollo 1, where three astronauts died when their capsule caught fire when they were inside of it. It was just a, a practice pressurization, but something sparked someplace and it, it had a fire in a pure oxygen environment. And before they could get the hatches open and rescue the crew, they had all burned to death. So oh my God. Uh, that's something that you don't want to repeat. That's one lesson you want to learn once and you want somebody else to learn it. You don't want to learn it yourself. So we determined that we would not let oxygen get into the cabin. In fact, we monitor the oxygen content in the cabin. We have telemetry that tells us how much oxygen is in the cabin and people on the ground monitor it and people in the airplane monitor it. And if it gets to uh, about 28%, we abort the flight. And, uh, and if it's on the way up to that number, we ventilate the cabin. We let the precious air out and we have a scuba bottle just one like if you were gonna go scuba diving down in the tropics, uh, we, we just use regular air and we can automatically, there's, there's automatic valves and software that control it. They let air back in, but we only have a limited amount of air in the scuba tank. And so we can't ventilate too much. So number one reason for the pilots having a hose that carries the oxygen away is that we don't want to create a fire hazard. The second reason is, I said it carries oxygen away. When you and I breathe, we only use about 10% of the oxygen in the breath. That's why mouth-to-mouth -mouth respiration revives somebody is because even though it's been in our lungs and we have, we have taken the oxygen that we need for that breath, there's still 90% of the oxygen left. And if you breathe it into somebody else, it can help revive them. So 90% of the oxygen that went to the pilot, the pilot didn't use. So the second hose goes to a scrubber where we scrub out the CO2. We add a little bit of oxygen back and a, a little, a little uh, squirt of air freshener so it tastes good when it comes back and it goes back to the pilot and they rebreathe the same oxygen again and again and again. So it means we have to carry less oxygen. Uh, the pilots don't wear pressure or don't wear parachutes, but the glider wears two. Uh, the first one is on the tail and it is an upset recovery parachute. These waves that, that the Perlin flies get so vigorous at times, at the top they break and they turn into the equivalent of white water at the edge of space. And you know that, that's in contrast to saying the stratosphere is flat and smooth and there's no turbulence there. 
Nope. At the top of these waves, at times can be the worst turbulence on the planet. So in case the glider gets upset and gets thrown into an unusual attitude, we have a drogue chute, uh, like drag cars have on the, on the back, and we can release it, and it goes out and it slows the glider down so we don't overspeed it and overstress it, and it gets the front end going forward and the back end in the back. If something happens to the glider and uh, it, it's no longer flyable, we've got a cargo chute attached to the glider. And it's not the one in the tail, but it is attached about in the middle of the airplane. And we can use the cargo chute. It's called the BRS, a ballistic recovery system. And you can ride the airplane clear to the ground. The pilots can't get out. Uh, they've just got little hatches. Uh, but they can ride the airplane to the ground. And it only takes about two minutes to get from 90,000 feet down to about 50,000 feet. Uh, it takes about three minutes to get from 90,000 feet down to what would be air where the pilots can depressurize the capsule and they can uh, let outside air in and breathe in. So if they have a problem with life support or something, they're only three minutes away from breathable air if they use the big drogue chute. We also are flying an airplane that is uh, never been flown at those speeds before that particular design. This is a one of a kind airplane and it's still, even though we're flying it operationally, it's still under flight testing. So we have built into the spar these weights that can rotate and, and they shake the spar. And what they do is they, they vibrate the spar anywhere from uh, once a second to 30 times a second and, and try and get the, the airplane to go into a flutter mode. Flutter modes in airplane designs can tear the airplane apart. Sometimes they are what engineers would call a divergent flutter. And that means the energy is, is retained and it's a little bit like the opera singer hitting a note and shattering the, the wine glass. Well, that can happen to an airplane structure is the energy builds up and builds up and builds up as the wings flex and the wing will finally just <clears throat> break off. And so what we want to know, and this is a display that is in the glider and on the ground, uh, we monitor and we shake the airplane at these various frequencies. And here you can see at about nine shakes a second, you can see that we got a little response here. It, it, it came up and it's bending and it's twisting. And what we wanna see is we wanna see that response go away immediately. And that means that the vibration mode is dampened. If it is not dampened, we have to go back to the engineers and say at a particular frequency, this airplane will shake itself apart. Now, as the air gets thinner, we have to fly faster and faster and faster, and that can induce the original shaking. So we don't want to introduce the shaking uh, without testing it. So this is built into the airplane because every time we went 5,000 feet higher, we would stop and make sure that we had dampened vibration modes. So uh, through... Through uh, these years, 16, 17, 18, 19, skip COVID. And in 2023, we take the glider down to near the Andes uh, in Patagonia. And this is work going on in, in the hangar. Uh, we launch balloons. We inspect the glider. We test things. And on days where the waves are good, we go fly. This is the team we take. Uh, we take about 20 people. They're from about five different countries, uh, three different universities. And we go down to Patagonia and we work for two months trying to extend ANAR's dream. Now, getting through the tropopause was a problem. So the first couple of years we went, we would uh, struggle through the tropopause like ANAR did. After we did it, 
We checked it off our list and said, okay, we proved we could do it. Now let's skip that. And we use a high altitude tow plane. Notice the tow plane is leaving a contrail. The tow plane here is flying at over 30,000 feet. We tow up into the stratosphere. In fact, we set a world record for the highest aero tow. We went to 47,000 feet, which was almost ANAR's record. It's still under tow. Then we release and we begin to climb in the wave. But what that does is it, it gets us into the strong part of the wave. It's analogous to a surfer using a jet ski and saying, I want to go out there and I want to get into the big wave. And the jet ski takes them out there instead of having them have to paddle all the way out. Uh, they get a ride out to the really big one and then they get released in the right spot on the big wave and then they surf it. Well, that's, that's what we are doing now. Uh, we have scientific work to do and it's important that we get high as often as we can and as quickly as we can. So the tow plane takes us out from the airport towards the Andes and uh, uh, then drops us off, not here at the ridge height, but takes us up to those high elevations. Now, this type of flying, you have to be extremely disciplined. So the pilots are checklist driven. And if, and if nothing checks out, we abort the flight. Uh, we do these flutter tests. Notice the plane is climbing and then we level it off here. And this is where we're doing flutter testing. We're doing flutter testing going up and flutter testing coming down. Even though we'd like to keep climbing and get higher altitudes, uh, the pilots are disciplined and say, no, we're not going higher unless we validate that the flutter is good. We have telemetry. Uh, the green boxes here are what these people are looking at on their on their computer screens and they are able to monitor the amount of oxygen in the pilot's uh, breathing loop, how much oxygen is left in the tank, how much battery is left, what's the altitude, but everything that is needed for a safe flight, they are able to monitor it. And we also collect scientific data. Uh, we look at satellites near the horizon. It's called a radio occultation system. And the degree of attenuation of the signal tells us how much humidity is in the air. We carry a microphone that listens to the sound of turbulence. It's a very low, low frequency rumble that's below what you and I can hear. But this microphone and software can pick it up. So we're mapping turbulence. So we're looking at the ozone hole. We're looking at particles and dust. We also carry scientific instruments built by students so that they get inspired to say, well, as my grandson says, Grandpa, we're doing real science. We share with uh, the students that have built the science experiments and share with anybody who wants. We share what we call the virtual cockpit and it shows how high the glider is. It shows the amount of oxygen left in the tanks. The air tank here is down to 47% already. The battery's at 30%. This is getting about the point where we have to say, time to come home. It also has a moving map that shows you where the glider has been. And the results have been that we have flown higher than commercial airliners. We've flown higher than the Concorde. We've flown higher than the U-2. In fact, these are the world records that have been set by the Perlin Project. Uh, the first one was set by ANAR and Steve Fawcett. And then the, the last five have been set by ANAR's pressurized glider, the one he dreamed about. The highest one, 76,124 feet. That's higher than the U-2 spy plane has ever reached. It is the highest subsonic crewed flight ever made in human history. So a glider holds the altitude record for all the fighter planes, anything that has ever been built by NASA in level flight. 
planes can go higher, but they have to use their engines and they go on a ballistic trajectory. So let me show you a quick video. 30 years ago, we discovered man-made chemicals had punched a hole in the ozone layer. Are you able to hear that okay? Yes. Okay, I will keep it rolling then. We will, I'll turn it up just a little bit. Is that hole here to stay? Waiting around to kill us? Today, we're trying hard to find out. Morgan Sandercock is about to test an experimental plane perfect for sampling ozone. We think we can go as high as 90,000 feet. Jim, you ready to go? I'm ready. That's the big boy territory. That's where things can go wrong very, very quickly. If we lose cabin pressure, then uh, the pilots could very easily pass out and uh, we don't have any automatic systems to recover from that. Getting ready to roll. Now a glider might sound like a dangerous choice so high up, but gliders don't have engines, which means they can't pollute the team's samples. Confirm tail dolly off. Tail dolly is off. Wing wheel is off. They're rolling at uh, 1132. 1132, written down GPS 5. Airborne. The Pearland Glider uses air rising over the Southern Andes to reach extraordinary heights. Airspeed, 70 knots. Looking beautiful and very high. Traffic. Fifty-two thousand feet up makes this the highest glider flight ever, but you've got to get this high to get a great picture of the ozone layer. The good news is that thanks to a global ban on ozone-harming chemicals, it looks like the hole is healing up. Our shield is regenerating. So two corrections since that video was made. Uh, we've gone higher than 52. 52 is the first world record we've set. And we've set four more after that. The highest flight, of course, was 76,000 feet. And this year in 23, the ozone was larger than it had ever been recorded. So the ozone hole grows and shrinks. And one of the reasons that it is larger than it's ever been is the, uh, the polar vortex was strong and the waves were stronger. And that uh, generation of, of these clouds is there. And chemically what happens is the clouds are made of nitrogen compounds. And some of the compounds are nitric acid. And the CFCs, the carbofluorohydrocarbons that uh, were in spray cans, uh, when, when they come in contact with these 
nitrogen particles in these Perlin clouds, it releases the chlorine. And then the chlorine is what transforms ozone into regular oxygen. Ozone is oxygen free molecules, O3, and what we normally have is O2. But the, the uh, clouds transform ozone into regular oxygen and make the ozone hole bigger, which lets the ultraviolet light come down to Earth. Years ago, we discovered. So, uh, one, of, one of the things that we have done is we put cockpit displays in that show us the wave. This is a horizontal slice in the cockpit. Uh, and it tells the pilots, they can see there's a little dot that shows them where they are on the moving map, and they can show where they think the waves are going to be. These wave models are computer generated, so they are not always perfectly accurate, but they give you a good idea that you have strong waves, and we can see the waves that would be invisible to the human eye or to, to radar. Now, uh, this could be useful for saving fuel for an air, airliner. If an airliner could ride the red part, they would get extra lift and they would save fuel and they'd get to altitude faster. Uh, I've been a glider pilot near the mountains and I've, I've heard airliners say, unable to maintain altitude. And a glider pilot says, get out of the blue, go over to the red, get out of the sink, go to the lift because they're in the down part and it is exceeding their airplane's ability to climb. So we are uh, talking to a national airline right now about possibly putting these types of displays in their cockpits to see if airliners could go fly the waves. The other thing is if you hit the waves head on, it's like hitting a, a washboardy road. Uh, or what the Australians call donga donga, and this will knock your fillings out. Or in this case, it'll throw the food cart around the cockpit. Uh, airliners have had people have serious injuries. They call it clear air turbulence, but it may be that they just flew into one of these wave fields in the stratosphere and the plane got knocked up and down and up and down and it caused injuries and it has damaged airplanes. So the purpose of the Perlin is to make air traffic safer and to understand in particular how the breaking waves that I talked about being a danger to the Perlin also mix the stratosphere and they change the weather around the globe. So what we are interested in is the growth of the ozone hole and weather changes caused by waves that are, that are 27, 28 kilometers over our heads, and we, we're not even aware they're there. Part of the Perlin's job is to get people aware of that. What happens in the stratosphere can affect severe weather. For instance, in 2019, uh, the Perlin documented what is known as a sudden stratospheric warming. The polar vortex broke down and, and the stratosphere was getting warmer very quickly. And this was a precursor, it was a sign that there was gonna be an early spring and a hotter spring. And it actually was a sign that there was gonna be a, a severe fire season and an early fire season in Australia. So this happens way, way, way over their heads. It happens in places where weather balloons don't usually fly, but we're learning that it affects the weather. Also, we fly in about 1% atmospheric density, which is the same as Mars. Now, the plane has to fly very, very fast. Uh, in those conditions, we have to go about 400 miles an hour just to make the wings work. So uh, it may not be a very practical means of travel on Mars, but we are testing whether or not, say, drones might be used. There's a Canadian company uh, that drops drones from balloons, and that could work on Mars. And we're testing whether or not you could use drones on Mars 
that could be radio controlled. You send them up in a balloon, you drop them, and they become radio controlled gliders that do scientific research. And then they come back to wherever you program them to land. Our next goal is to beat the SR-71, the Blackbird, uh, their highest altitude was 74,000 feet. If we break that, it means a glider will be the highest flying airplane. Now we have to say the highest flying subsonic airplane. But if we can beat the SR-71, if we can get another 8,000 foot higher on one of our research flights, we can just drop the subsonic and just say a glider is the highest flying airplane in history. So that's it. Now it's time for questions. Well, that was, that was fantastic, Ed. I really appreciate uh, you bring us, uh, bringing us up to speed on the Perlin. And uh, I'll open it up here. Does so anyone uh, have a question? I think you're able to unmute. But he's a little shy. I'm not sure. <laughs> I know either a lot of the people. Either that, Gary, or I put him asleep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking. I thought I had a. I had thought of one question myself. There. Give me a second here. One well, I guess years. I. I've got a question. Yeah. You know yes. how how does how does one go for a flight in the Perlin? <laughs> well, uh, there's a couple of qualifications, you have to be a test pilot and a glider pilot. Oh, I've got one of those. <laughs> Which one? Glider pilot. Well, uh, the, the other thing is uh, we have taken the CEO of Airbus for a low altitude unpressurized flight because you don't have to be, uh, you don't have to be uh, a test pilot for that. It's it's a safe glider flight, but it didn't get very high. It got about ten thousand feet high. So uh, yes. sponsors and and people like that can can go for short hops. Gotcha. Thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, it was awesome. My pleasure, Jack. Anyone else? Anybody want to be a test pilot? Follow in the footsteps of somebody who built model airplanes and learned to fly gliders and then decided just to keep going down that path. <laughs> Became an Air Force pilot and then oh, dreamed up this project. So you guys, you just finished uh, a trip there to Argentina. So you were there for two months? Yes, we were there for uh, the last uh, 10 days of uh, July and then August and most of September. And what kind of experiments, like you had mentioned that you had a lot of kids providing experiments, how, how does that work and how would a person figure out how to get an experiment to you? Well, and what, uh, what would they entail, like some examples maybe? Well, the, uh, the students get to choose what they want us to fly. We don't put any requirements on them except for it needs to be in the form of a cube set that's a cube 10 centimeters on a side. It needs to be uh, have its own power, so it's got to be battery operated. And it has to be uh, tested to make sure that in a vacuum it doesn't pose any kind of a fire, fire risk because it's in an unpressurized part of the airplane. It's, it's back here in the, in the back part of the fuselage. And then the students choose what they want. We've had students say, we just want to know the temperature. One class wanted us to carry moss up above the ozone hole and then uh, to watch and see if moss that had flown up in the higher radiation uh, 
did any better or any worse than moss that had stayed uh, below the ozone hole. So they, they had a biological experiment. Others do uh, pressure. Uh, we had the University of Kentucky do this, uh, this sound experiment, listening for turbulence. So the schools decide, and we've had everybody from fourth graders up through PhD students uh, make experiments. We took uh, about a dozen experiments this year from about 12 different schools to, uh, to Argentina with this. But all you have to do is tell us, we'd like to make uh, a CubeSat and we could hook you up with people that can give you the coaching on how that's done. We, we have a partnership with Teachers in Space and they have the technical know-how. Uh, and can is there some place where people can view results from some of these prior ones? Uh, you know, yes, yeah, yeah. You can. Let me. Uh, there, there's there's it, there's a website. If you go to the Perlin website, uh, mm -hmm. and you go to to science, there's there's a button that says view the data. Oh, okay, excellent, good, yeah. Okay. And we we post all the data publicly so scientists all over the world and schools all over the world can, can use it. Interesting. Anyone else have a question? I do. What, what is, uh, what's the, the goal of your of your organization, what uh, what do you, well what the do mission you with air cadets? What what do they hope to accomplish? Well, the mission is to uh, <laughs> create uh, uh, top notch citizens and uh, leaders and instill a uh, uh, sense or love or desire for aviation. Sounds like Anar to me. <laughs> yeah, he sounds seems like, like quite sounds the... Like, sounds like this kind of guy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What age range do you have? Uh, I think it's 12 to... 15. 16. Okay. Are you age out at 19. Or nine, yeah, age out at nineteen. Okay. So, yeah, so through our program, uh, there's two opportunities for cadets. Uh, you know, we there's a lot of cadets, and there's only so many spots. But we have a a glider program in the summer, where cadets uh, go through a selection process, write their ground school exams, and uh, uh, get selected to get their glider wings over a two-month period. And then there's also a power program. So the same sort of idea, and they get a couple months to get their power license uh, over the summer through. Uh, we That's contracted out to flying schools. And okay. so there's a number of, of kids across the country that get these opportunities. That's great. That uh, ANAR started uh, just helping out at the local lighter port, and uh, and that that got him into flying when he was when he was thirteen and fourteen years old. Oh yeah, yeah. He would have made a great cadet, you know. <laughs> and with cadets, there is no cost to get your glotters. Or pilots license. Wow, that's special. Yeah. That, that's that's quite a privilege. Yeah, yeah, but you got to put the work in, right? So, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, if I don't see any other questions here, I uh, have to say that was uh, I hadn't heard about this. Uh, plane before any of this stuff before my colleague Steve turned me on to you so I really appreciate him uh, doing that and I, I really enjoyed your presentation 
on uh, the Pearland project at and uh, on behalf of the Air Cadet League of Saskatchewan, really like to thank you for taking some time to share this with us. And we're gonna rec we it's re re uh, recorded it, and you know we will put it on our Air Cadet League website, so those that couldn't attend have an opportunity to take a look. And I'm gonna go dabble and take a look at the uh, science tab on your. Uh, Perlan web page there just to see that some of that data you were talking about. Some of the data is still in raw format, but if you uh, download a, a data sheet and highlight the whole thing and tell Excel to make a graph, it turns yeah. into graphs. Oh, that's the one one question I had. And uh, so it sounds like you uh, your team there uses AI to generate maps of the waves for That's the right. pilots. Yep. So how do they, which data are they using and, and who developed this AI program to do that? Uh, it's called a WARF model, um, W-R-F, and it uses, uh, it uses data provided by either the European weather authorities or the North American weather authorities. And uh, it, various weather scientists have improved this model to where if you put in winds, temperatures, topography, it calculates whether there will be waves or not. Yeah. I always hear negative things about AI, so this is sounds like a positive one. Yeah, yeah, we used we used AI to help us uh, help us find the right paths up through the. So if you let's see, where is the access to data? So I clicked on about and went to science, and then here's the button up here that says access to data. Mm-hmm. And it takes you to a site where all the data is shared. Okay. And then, and then it's uh, once once it comes up, you can pick a flight and pick a data set, and then Excel does a pretty good job of turning it into graphs. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So it's got all the altitudes we reached and and you can go then look at the look at the data sets so you can you can look at say uh, the ultraviolet a and b and download it excuse me yes i have a question Please. I was just wondering how long would it take to descend back down to the ground from 76,000 feet? Um, are you doing it in an emergency or are you just coming down normally? Like just like as planned? As planned. It takes about an hour to come down. So okay. we'll come down at, uh, you know, a thousand feet a minute or 1500 feet a minute. So it takes an hour to come down a nice, a nice sightseeing glide. And what about in an emergency? Uh, we can get, we can get to the ground in about uh, five minutes. We can get to breathable air in about three minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay. But that's the data. So it's mm -hmm. like like this one has got sixty thousand data points in it. If you look at the number over here on the side. Yeah. Yeah. Big chunk of data. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. That's a good question. How long does it take to get down? One of, one of yeah. the other questions we 
get is where do the pilots go to the bathroom? And uh, <laughs> that, that's a joke. It's it. Somebody says, what kind of underwear do glider pilots on long flights wear? Do they wear jockey shorts or boxers? And somebody replied, depends. They wear diapers. <laughs> The plane's too small for a bathroom. Yeah. All right. Well, Ed, I, uh, once again, I want to thank you for uh, spending time with us here. This was excellent. And uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. I would be happy to do that. Thank you for thank inviting you very me. Much. I hope all of yep. your flights are are enjoyable and I hope you all soar high in your life. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ed. Very interesting. Thanks, Wayne. Bye for now. We will post this on our website uh, in a few days. Okay. Bye everybody. Have a good evening.